Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeff Gump. I'm the Chief IT Architect at Case Western Reserve University, and I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Bill St. Arnaud. He is the Chief Research Officer of Canary, uh, the equivalent of uh, Internet 2 in Canada. Um, Bill has been involved in, in IT and in networking for a long time, and he's currently involved in the coordination and implementation of Canada's next generation optical uh, internet initiative. And he is a, uh, he has a widely read, read blog um, about uh, green IT, green broadband, and green IT infrastructure. Bill? Thanks, Jeff. Well, thanks everybody. Um, this talk here is about this one I've given several times, a few little updates, and it's just the, uh, the crisis we're facing in terms of climate change uh, over the next uh, decade or so. Uh, Obama's new science team has made up of some very uh, serious thinkers on this topic, um, particularly uh, John Holdren, uh, who says the term climate change or global warming is incorrect. What he says we should be calling this is global climatic disruption. And he has a wonderful uh, video on YouTube, which I really encourage you to take a look at, or uh, to have your friends or colleagues. It really describes in about five minutes the seriousness of this challenge and the devastating consequences we're likely to face if we don't quickly adjust our lifestyles to uh, reduce CO2 emissions. Also, Stephen Chu is the new head of the Department of Energy, of course. Uh, there's, he has written a couple of papers and ones like Wake Up America. Uh, a lot of people are simply not aware of the severity of the problem. We're in for some real serious uh, consequences at major tipping points. In fact, the United States uh, Geological Survey and last week, uh, Obama spoke at, the Na spoke at the National Academies of Science, and the re researchers are now talking about tipping points. And there's 10 major climatic tipping points that are likely to happen within the next decade, uh, which will really uh, you know, change the climate, change the agriculture, everything here in North America, uh, most likely being a major drought in the southwest, uh, but the ice melting in the Arctic, uh, the Ways ice shelf, the Western Arctic ice shelf, the Greenland ice shelf, the, uh, the great conveyor currents in the Atlantic and so forth are all going to be likely to be affected. And uh, we are going to see some real big temperature changes uh, here in, in North America in particular. A newer, more recent study from MIT just came out, looked at all the international panel climate change models, which you've probably seen out there. Uh, these are the different models and the confidence intervals uh, done by various research groups out there. So when you hear from the re reports that the current predicted average increase in temperature is going to be 2.1 degrees, that's the median of a, a confidence interval uh, that's shown in this gray bar. That was, uh, came out from the IPCC, of course, about three or four years ago, but all the data since then is that we are warming much faster than any of the models predicted. In fact, this new MIT study took a look at all the data that went into the calculating the confidence intervals, and they say, and recalculated all this, and they're estimating now that the median temperature by 2100 will be 5.1 degrees increase. To put that in context, the last ice age, the world's average temperature was six degrees colder than it is now. And Cleveland and most of Canada was under two or three miles of ice. And in 80 or 90 years, we're going to go about the same temperature degrees in the opposite direction. So if we're under two or three miles of ice with six degrees colder, imagine what's going to happen if we're going to be five to six degrees warmer in 80 years. We will be in a desert here. So this is, people are simply not aware of the dire consequences we're facing if we don't do something very drastically and very quickly to reduce CO2. Now, thankfully, we have now a team in Washington who understands these issues, or at least in the administration, and hopefully we'll have uh, Waxman and so forth, we'll have a, a, a cap and trade in place here in the United States, uh, which will hopefully will galvanize the rest of the world. But the big concern is, is these tipping points. If we have a severe drought, or ma massive forest fires or something like that, there'll be a real huge uh, hue and cry to do something immediately. And the concern is then the governments will be forced to impose moratoriums on building new coal plants or even shut down coal plants. And so what you may be facing is not high energy costs from cap and trade, but simply no energy at all. And this is going to really affect you in places like Ohio, where uh, most of your power comes from coal, uh, which is, of course, one of the major contributors. And if these things come to pass, You've, you're going to face some real serious problems here. So what we, I'm advising universities and businesses and so forth, this is the mother of all disaster planning. 
start thinking at least for your critical IT systems and from other facilities on your campus to design them, protect them against this possible, hopefully remote, potential of a moratorium or a shutdown of coal plants. And because then power will be rationed and universities are not likely to be at the top of the queue in terms of uh, power. So if some of your critical systems have their own independent power source, they go to a small windmill on campus or solar panels, at least you can protect those systems. This is a study that came, that was produced by uh, Ramathan and Yang, the Scripps Institute, just showing this probability range and the likely tipping points that are going to happen. And this is based on the IPCC median temperature of 2.1 degrees, which is the, the peak of that confidence interval. And then this is a 90% confidence interval range. But it shows you if they are wrong in that data, if the, if the, the median is at 2.1 degrees, uh, but even at that, we'll see Himalayan and Tibetan glaciers disappear, Arctic summer ice disappear, which is likely now to happen within two years, uh, Greenland ice sheet, and then as we move further up the confidence interval, uh, Amazon rainforest, uh, the, the great conveyor current, um, and the West Arctic ice sheet uh, disappearing. Uh, and so, and that's up to the four degree, but now everybody's saying the median temperature is likely to be 5.1, which is already in the far right of the confidence interval, and it has its own confidence curve. So it's particularly that ways, the Western Ar Antarctic ice sheet, that is sitting on land that's currently below sea level. It's half the Antarctic ice sheet is sitting on land below the uh, uh, sea level now. And the concern is, as these big glaciers you've been hearing about calve off, seawater will get underneath the Western Antarctic ice shelf and rapidly break it up or float it away even. And so the probability then of a major increase of sea levels of up to 30 meters is a really high probability now. So as they begin to understand these mechanisms that are happening out there. So our challenge is, is that right now in North America, uh, we're a little bit even worse in Canada, believe it or not, even with our hydropower, is that our average CO2 uh, production per year, emissions per year is 26 tons per person. If we want to slow down, not even stop or reverse CO2 warming, we just want to try to slow it down so we can spread out these uh, temperature implications over a long time period, we have to reduce our amount of CO2 to two tons per person in 40 years from now and one ton per person by 2100. Again, this was based on the original IPCC data, and now the scientists say, actually, we have to get down to a t one ton by 2050. Now, you can imagine that that's gonna affect everything, our, our transportation, the way we live, the way we work, and so forth, if we have any hope of achieving these goals. It's a major challenge. It's gonna affect the way we do research. It's gonna affect our life on universities. And so, it's, it, but there is some good news, but I mean, we think ICT can really play an important role in helping us to meet these goals, uh, but first, we have to clean up our own act as well. We, we who use ICT in our daily lives for education, research, or networking, and so forth, uh, we also are contributing to this global warming. Uh, a recent report came out last year called An Inefficient Truth, take off on Al Gore's uh, Inconvenient Truth, pointed out that ICT in total uh, produces about 2 to 3 percent of the world's global emissions. Now, obviously, that's not directly, uh, that's the same, greater than the aviation industry. And so we're not spewing it out through the back end of our fans, it's through all the electricity consumed to power computers or servers or networks and so forth. And if that power comes from coal, that's where the contributions are coming from. ICT now consumes about 8 to 9 percent of electricity in the U.S. and most OECD countries uh, and is rapidly growing because of the demand for ICT and so forth. In fact, the future internet, just the routers alone, now forget about the networks and computers, is estimated to consume 5 percent of all electricity. <coughs> and if that's produced by coal, that's going to be huge CO2 production. It's, that's an unsustainable path. We cannot allow that to happen. In fact, one study from Japan says ICT will be 20% of global emissions if we continue on this path. And the biggest culprits, <coughs> excuse me, are universities, particularly research intensive universities like Case Western. Uh, I was at an EDUCAUSE meeting. We did a back of the envelope calculation. We figured universities produce between 5 to 10% of all CO2 emissions in the United States. A typical research university, for example, University of Indiana, produces 500,000 tons of CO2 per year, of which 300,000 tons just comes from data center and computing facilities alone on the campus. Now, uh, we hope that cap and trade will be passed by Congress this year, and this will really wake up the, uh, your eyes of your president. Most people ignore the ICT people on their campus, don't know who they are, and there's just those geeks in the corners looking after the network. When they come to realize with cap and trade that the price of power will triple on a campus like Case Western, and the biggest culprit is ICT, uh, heads are going to roll, and you better have some solutions. 
So it's a major problem. All these great things we're doing with uh, supporting education and so forth and all these collaborative technologies, we've got to do them in a way that does not impact the environment. Here's a, uh, from a typical smaller university in Canada. Uh, in Canada, some of our governments now are mandating the uh, universities be carbon neutral by next year. So they're doing what are called baseline emissions measurements. This is a very intensive task to find out uh, who's the biggest contributors, so the culprits in terms of CO2, and what they all have to do to be carbon neutral. And if the universities are not carbon neutral by March next year, they have to pay into a fund. So research dollars will immediately go back out into this fund, uh, which will uh, go to build windmills and so forth. So this is a university of maybe 20,000 students. Uh, most of this electricity happens in BC is hydro-based, so they don't have the problem electricity as you do here at Case Western. But even then, uh, they uh, have to uh, uh, reduce this upper line shows where the projected growth curve is, and they have to follow the red line to meet, meet these targets by government. Also in governments in the UK and Europe now are, are also uh, basing funding uh, to universities, both the research and operation is on their CO2 footprint. And I know a number of state governments are looking at this in the U.S., the NSF is looking at this, uh, and so you better prepare for this. Your funding is going to be very much based on your carbon footprint. Who is the biggest culprit on this campus? Well, it happens to be the research intensive buildings. The ones with all the computers in particular, but also the ones with the fume hoods, are the two biggest sources of the CO2 emissions. Uh, your, physics, uh, your teaching building is not so bad, your gym course is not so bad as well. It's the research intensive facilities that are really the major culprits and we have to find solutions to how to address that without uh, hopefully you know, reducing the imp or impacting on the quality of the research. Uh, so, so that's the bad news. The good news is we believe that ICT and the internet is critical to reducing CO2. There was an excellent report that came out again last year called Smart 2020 and they believe that using the internet and ICT, we can reduce our carbon footprint by as much as 20%. And this is equivalent to all the combined emissions of both the United States and China. So if we can be smart, as our previous speaker talked about, our smart buildings, smart transportation, and ways we do our carry out our research, particularly with computing and networking, uh, we can have a very positive impact and perhaps uh, you know, really be the most important tool at our university or in society at large for reducing CO2. We do not have any other known technology, even carbon sequestration, will not equal the impact that networks and ICT can have, possibly, in reducing CO2. So these collaborative technologies, yes, they consume power, produce CO2, but they also can maybe be used as a very powerful tool in the opposite direction to help people reduce travel and transportation and so forth. This is from the ICT report showing the various sectors where the contributions can be made, and key sectors include transportation, buildings, industrial processes, and so on and so, uh, and so forth. And so, as I mentioned, no other sector, no other technology has this enabling effect as the potential of ICT for reducing CO2 carbon footprint. Why is this important? Uh, in the business world now, we're seeing RFPs from customers and from governments to include what's called shadow carbon cost accounting. So, for example, the UK government, now some state governments here, are demanding vendors to provide the carbon cost of their solution. So if you're providing computers, networks, whatever it is, trucks and so forth, you must calculate all the carbon inputs and outputs, and your proposal will be evaluated on the carbon cost. Uh, first, another they're saying it's called shadow carbon cost because it's not going to be given as high priority as a true capital cost, but that's going to change over time. As I mentioned, the UK government's linking financing to universities and researchers based on their carbon footprint, and uh, their government RFPs are now are, are including carbon costs, accounting on all RFP responses. And other states and EU countries are expected to uh, follow very shortly. And this is all going to move very, very rapidly if we have some sort of climate crisis, as, for example, a huge uh, set of forest fires because of a drought here in the United States and so forth. Now, what you're going to hear from a lot of vendors and equipment people is energy efficiency. Now, the way we're going to solve this is being more energy efficiency, uh, efficient in our, in our equipment, in our operations, and so forth. Well, unfortunately, that's a falsehood. And this is a phenomenon that is, was discovered by economists called Jevons way back in the time of James Watt, uh, who noticed that when James Watt improved the efficiency of the steam engine, demand for the steam engine went up, and it went into many more applications. And he noted this phenomenon, and then we, it was forgotten about it, but it was rediscovered by two economists called Kazum Brooks uh, after the last energy crisis in 1973. At that time, the U.S. Congress passed a set of laws called the CAFE laws, mandating for the first time minimum mileage for our cars, minimum insulation for our homes, and the Energy Star uh, uh, program for appliances. 
Everybody applauded themselves in the back and said, great, through this energy efficiency, we'll reduce our demand of oil, we'll wean ourselves off all that foreign oil, and we'll be a much more productive country. Well, we all know the exact opposite happened. The United States is even now more dependent on foreign oil. And the, what the economists discovered was what energy efficiency does, it reduces the cost of operating a product or a service. And a natural consumer response, therefore, is if my car is now cheaper to run, I can drive it further, or I can buy a bigger car. Similarly, my house is cheaper to cool or heat, I can afford a bigger home and bigger appliances and so forth. So what energy efficiency does, is it, this is called the energy efficiency paradox, is actually stimulate more energy consumption. Now, energy efficiency is important, don't get me wrong, this is it's an important part of our toolkit, but that alone, as a policy objective, is going to result in the same thing that happened with 1973. We must be combine energy efficiency with an increased cost of our energy consumption, for example, through a cap and trade system. But right now, there's too much focus on energy efficiency, particularly in the IT world from vendors. And what people are already discovering, we're already seeing the same phenomena. There's many studies in this area. And in fact, it's actually increasing the demand for these say, IT products because it's reducing the cost of operating them. So it's something to be very, very concerned about. What we have is not an energy problem. The critical problem facing this planet is carbon. And it's the carbon we want, what we want to reduce. And sometimes, reducing energy consumption is not the right answer. And there's many good examples of this. For example, in northern climates, people talk about turn off all your computers, turn off all your lights. In fact, sometimes that's the wrong solution in countries in northern climates like here in Ohio in the wintertime. Why is that? Because buildings are designed to assume a heat load from your computers and lights. Now, depending where your power source comes from, whether it's coal and gas and so forth, when you return off all those computers and lights, the building heat must be maintained, and the heat capacity must come from somewhere else, like gas or coal plant, if you have a coal plant for your energy for, on your campus. And the net result is your carbon footprint increases because you turned off all your computers and lights. So you really have to do this analysis very carefully, and this, the very obvious approach is sometimes not the correct approach. Always think carbon first, not energy conservation. Think of how I can reduce my carbon footprint, and the solutions you come to for that could be vastly different than th of how we reduce energy consumption. So we believe, in fact, if we, that we have to, have to move to, even beyond that. We have to move to a zero carbon strategy, not carbon neutrality. In fact, some people are talking about what's called a positive carbon strategy, where we actually even take carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's the only hope we have of slowing down or reversing this trend. There's a lot of misconceptions out there that, that once we stop producing carbon, the problem is solved. The carbon we're putting in the atmosphere right now will stay there for thousands of years. So any more we add is going to increase the global warming. And it's, it's not like acid rain. Once we stop producing the sulfur dioxide from power plants, the problem with acid rain disappears. Climate change is something that we're going to have to live with for the next two millennia. It's going to affect our children, grandchildren, many generations, therefore. So the, the more we put in, the more we start reducing now, the, the less this impact will have over the next 2,000 years. So we believe that we have to move to zero carbon as quickly as possible, because the reason for that is that because of this Kazoom uh, uh, Brooks postulate, because of increased efficiency will increase energy consumption, that if we have, if our energy source is zero, if we, our mix of energy comes from renewable sources, then it doesn't matter how much energy we consume, because anything times zero is zero. So we know in the IT world that we're always going to see greater demands for more computers, more networks, and so forth. That's inevitable. Uh, we've seen that on the internet, the doubling of demand every two years or every year and so forth. We know that's not going to cease. And we think because IT can play such an important role, demand for IT can go up further. We've got to make sure that the power for our IT equipment comes from renewable sources. Nuclear, I don't rule out nuclear. But the biggest problem with nuclear power is the time to market. The next nuclear plant in North America is at least a decade, a decade away. We can't wait that long. So our only hope is renewable energy sources from windmills, solar panels, hydro, uh, tidal power if you're near the coast, and so on and so forth. The big problem we have with renewable power sources is they're a long distance away from where we have the power. And this is where high-speed networking becomes very important. The IT industry is the one industry we have the, the advantage where we don't have to locate our big computers and data farms here on campus, we can move them to where the power is. And this way we can avoid uh, the need for new transmission lines. We can use our high-speed research networks uh, to access instrumentation computers, databases that are powered by renewable sources somewhere else in the country. So 
Uh, the big advantage of this by moving, looking at relocating computers, data centers, and facilities is that there's going to be huge demand for renewable power from all sources. When cap and trade comes, that's going to triple the price of power from coal. So everybody in this state is going to, every industry is going to want to move to renewable power. And they're going to, and so that the price for renewable power is going to skyrocket. Uh, so, but you can't move a bank, you can't move a car plant and so forth, but you can move the IT sector. So if you, you don't want to be competing with everybody else for that renewable power that's coming from windmills in the Midwest or wherever they're located. And that's the big advantage we have. And so, the, so using optical networks, using research networks like Internet2 and NLR, we can locate our computing data facilities in the, near the windmills, or we can even purchase our own wind, windmills, locate them on campus. There's a new type of windmill out there called Vertical Axis, 20, 50 kilowatts. There's not those huge, massive ones that everybody complains about. They're very inconspicuous, and you can locate them on campus or in better wind locations uh, to power your own uh, equipment and so forth. We believe it's very important that you get, get off the electrical grid. Uh, particularly for your critical IT infrastructure. Because this huge demand for renewable power, everybody's going to be on the grid and those prices are going to skyrocket. If you have your own independent sources of power not connected to the grid, then you've got a guaranteed price of power uh, and you're not going to be affected by prices jumping, tripling, quadrupling and so forth. And so this is the big advantage we have. There's already many examples of this. Uh, the big companies like Google, Cisco, Yahoo, Microsoft are already thinking about this. They're realizing this is coming. And so they're building the new data centers at hydro dams and windmills and so forth. For example, Google has bought an old uh, aluminum power plant on the Columbia River. They have their own hydroelectric dam for this big facility. And this is what they see as a competitive advantage. Now, with their own power source, their comp cost of power is known and constant for the next 20 years. And while all the competitors start paying uh, for cap and trade power and so forth, uh, this is going to have a huge competitive advantage for them. And there's many other companies building on the Columbia River and other locations as well. There's thousands, even here in Ohio in the south, but throughout the northeast, there's thousands of abandoned dams that were built in the 20s and 30s during our initial, initial electrification. These sites are ideal for small data centers and with now what are called new run-on-the-river turbines. The dam is there, all the infrastructure is gone, but you can buy these run-on-the-river turbines for 20 kilowatts, even up to a megawatt. They, uh, they don't disrupt fish, they don't disrupt the aquatic life, and they're ideal for small data centers. And so if you're smart, uh, if, I don't know if our case questions are land grant university or whatever, but you want to get a hold of one of these old dams or in parks or whatever and uh, get the rights to them and, uh, and all you need is an optical network. You don't need an electrical transmission line to relocate your data center to these facilities. But other approaches are to build windmills on campus. There's companies now, uh, Reed Hunt, uh, former chairman of the FCC, is ahead of one of these companies, uh, who are building uh, windmills for customers, businesses and data centers, uh, in the UK, Europe, and now starting here in the United States, they're in actually negotiating in Australia right now, at no cost to the customer. They'll come to the university or your facility, build a windmill, as long as you sign up a 10-year contract to purchase power from this windmill uh, for the next uh, decade at a given price, which is usually a lot cheaper than the price you currently pay for power from your local utility. And so these are the types of things you want to start thinking about in your planning. A, it's, it will save you money, and B, it will give you protection uh, from cap-and-trade and from disasters if these come to pass. Uh, other, there's uh, solar power data centers in California, uh, in Wyoming, Cheyenne, there's a wind power data center, uh, and many of these are being deployed commercially now around the world. Iceland, of course, is doing this. And another interesting project is in the Nordic countries. Um, uh, what the, the, the funding councils there have told all university researchers now, you must include the carbon cost of your research in any proposal to us. So the high performance computing people, so they said, listen, you can buy a small computer and you have to include the cost of carbon, the cost of power with that in your own office or room or lab, or you can relocate uh, your computer to Iceland and get uh, something that's five times the capacity because Iceland can provide free geothermal power and build a computer center for all the Nordic countries. And so now what's underway is all the Nordic universities are moving their HPC facilities uh, to Iceland where they get this uh, free geothermal power and they can do this because Iceland's connected with very high-speed optical networks back to the Nordic countries. This is the type of thinking that's required now as we look forward in terms of our campuses and universities is to work with Internet2 and NLR to say where can we base some of our equipment and facilities, particularly our critical stuff, in the eventuality that of a disaster or the certainty of cap and trade. So we also have an initiative in, in Canada right now uh, to really help work with the universities to demonstrate this capability. 
uh, we believe not only in relocating data centers, we believe the network itself must be carbon uh, zero as well. Uh, because if you start moving all this gear to these remote data centers, uh, the load on the network's going to go up and need bigger routers and, net and switches and so forth. And so what we're doing is uh, piloting a concept, working with researchers to relocate their computers and facilities, and also building a zero carbon network so we don't compensate the movement of the university with higher carbon cost on the network. The other important aspect of that is to do the carbon offset trading. A lot of this development and a lot of this new networks and capabilities can be paid for through what are called carbon offsets, particularly when the cap and trade system comes into place. What are called, in, that, in that case, they use the word permits. So what we're trying to do is work with several universities here in the States, Cal IT, UCSD, Columbia, um, um, North Carolina State, uh, we invite uh, West, the Case Western and other universities if you're interested to participate in this, is to do the actual carbon capture and emissions trading. And that is to do your baseline emission, take a, a computer cluster or a network facility, measure its actual carbon footprint right now through the power consumption and so forth, move that gear or take that gear off the grid and power it by a windmill, and then calculate our carbon change result from there. Take that difference and then take it to the carbon trading exchanges like the Chicago Carbon Exchange or several other ones out there. Or more likely, with cap and trade, is to deal with utilities. Utilities either will have to buy permits from a government uh, to emit carbon, or they can go to the customers and say, the customer reduces their carbon, we'll give you that money instead. So what you want to start planning is doing your baseline emissions measurements now, uh, even before you start even thinking moving computers, do your baseline emission measurements, get that baseline, because you can't get your carbon dollars until after you do your baseline emission measurement. And then when you plan to move those computers or you're forced to move those computers, do the calculation, and that can represent real cash. It can more than pay for the computers themselves, the moving in the new networks and so forth. So what we're doing is re-understanding that whole process. It's a really like an audit, financial audit process. It's very comprehensive. It's burdensome. It takes about a year to do this, undertake a baseline emissions measurement. There are online courses put on by the uh, Greenhouse Gas Institute. It will train ICT people in how to do this. Uh, and I think it's very important that you know and understand how to do, undertake that. And so this is what we're doing, work with our universities to help them get ready for this and uh, start thinking about how to reduce their footprint. And one of the things we're trying to demonstrate is that we can build a network using all the network nodes, routers, computers, and everything will be powered solely by renewable sources, and we can believe that the network can be as made as reliable as the one you have today. Even though we're off the grid, off the electrical grid, uh, we can, the beauty of the internet, the apocryphal story was designed to survive a nuclear war, we think it can at least survive global climate change. And that's to make the nodes wind powered or solar powered and use rerouting, the natural rerouting capability of the internet so that when the sun goes down or the wind dies on a node, we can reroute the traffic to another data center, use clouds and virtualization to quickly move the data sets from site to site uh, and so that the researcher or the user still has the same capability and doesn't notice any deficit or deficiency in latency, usability and so on and so forth. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's these new set of wind windmills called vertical axis turbines, which you can place in your campus. The uh, lower picture there shows one of these. It's a 50 kilowatt unit on a building at a CGEP, which is sort of a community college in Quebec. Uh, but there's another one there in a park in Montreal, which is about 100 kilowatts. And then there's these other ones, which are called tethered uh, turbines, uh, which you go up in a balloon about 1,000 feet, where you get much more consistent winds. Uh, and these are all possible scenarios. So you don't need those big, massive megawatt turbines that the utilities are building, which everybody objects to. You can build these smaller ones on your campus or in locations where you may have good wind conditions, and these can you use to power your critical infrastructure locally, and or your router nodes and so on and so forth. They're very expensive now. The price of turbines is coming down to about $1,500 per kilowatt. That's a one-time capital cost all in, or you can deal with an ESCO and have them build it for you, and you then sign up for a long-term contract. And so when you look at the amortized cost, so that's very, very cheap for your cost of power. And what you need, then you need is to architect your network so that can, and this is why ICT becomes very critical, to sustain, do things, move things around if the wind dies or the sun sets and so forth. You don't want to be using diesel backup and you don't want to be using batteries. The carbon footprint of both those are not terrible, the worst than actually being connected to the electrical grid. So that's what we want to try to avoid as much as possible. Now, that's, so that's what universities can do, but I think universities can also play a very important leadership role in helping governments and society address this major challenge facing the planet. As you know, governments and politicians are wrestling with the issues of how we're going to price out carbon, how we're going to tackle this uh, one thing is carbon taxes, 
Uh, economists say that's the best and most neutral way of doing this, but it's almost a politically impossible thing to sell, particularly in this current financial crisis. Uh, and so it's unlikely to go forward. Uh, Jim Hansen, of course, the famous scientist at NASA, said this is the only thing that will work. Uh, you know, I, I tend to agree with him, but I just can't see how we can sell it. So the other one is cap and trade. And cap and trade is really is our carbon tax. It's a hidden tax. And it's going to be on your electrical consumption, basically. But the other thing is I want to point out to you that under the new EPA regulations here in the United States, as you know, carbon has been uh, designated as a pollutant. It's going through a, a 60 day review. Now, when that happens, all institutions that have a carbon footprint over 25,000 tons will have to register with the EPA. That includes just about every university. And that means you'll be directly regulated under cap and trade. You will be forced to reduce your CO2 uh, uh, under cap and trade uh, at, at, at universities, particularly in the Midwest, which are, are so dependent upon coal. So this is going to be a very serious issue. So cap and trade is going to fit, affect you, but it's useful as it's a hidden tax. It will affect mostly the electrical supply side, uh, and uh, that's where governments are likely to go, as we're seeing here in the United States. Another approach is carbon neutrality imposed by law. A lot of state governments and provinces in Canada have done this. Uh, where California is looking at this, Washington State and several others, because uh, it's something they can do directly. The problem with carbon tax, we don't know, it just will increase the cost of carbon, will it stop carbon production? Cap and trade, again, the same issue. Just man mandating it, particularly in public sector buildings, is a very quick solution. Governments like this because it means no burdensome tax on politicians, and it's all those public sector universities, and we don't have to worry about them at all. And this, this will impose very severe constraints upon you. So it's not the cost of energy that's going to affect you. It's going to be a moratorium on energy that will really hurt you uh, if you're not prepared for that. But we believe there's another approach, and that's using these collaborative technologies like you use today. That's using ICT as a reward mechanism, rather right? than penalizing students and the public through carbon taxes and cap and trade. We think this is all part of the toolkit. There's a third alternative, and that's to reward people uh, with ICT products and services that are hopefully uh, zero carbon and provide them these services uh, in exchange for reducing their carbon footprint. So rather than penalizing people, can we not use a variety of IC virtual products on our networks, like uh, uh, virtual textbooks, movies and videos, all sorts of health services, collaborative technologies for students and faculty in exchange for them reducing their carbon footprint? So rather than charging them for these acts, these products and services, we say we'll work with equipment vendors or the software vendors, provide to you for free if you somehow reduce your carbon footprint and we can measure that. And it's going to be free cell phone services, free internet services, a number of things. We have a project in Ottawa where we're giving away free fiber and high-speed internet to the home in exchange for the customer uh, paying a small premium on their energy bill uh, as sort of like a carbon tax. The reason why we want to do this is a study by the European Commission Joint Research Centre that shows that virtualization and dematerialization of products and services can contribute to about 20% reduction of CO2. They say it's about 18% because they assume that ICT consumption to support this will increase with a net effect of about 15 to 18%. We believe we can make that top bar uh, zero uh, through building zero carbon networks. Notice that virtual meetings and that and telework play a very small impact in terms of uh, dematerialization and reducing CO2. And so I think a good examples of this now uh, is uh, delivering music and video that we're doing over the internet. We now do it for a, a noble purpose, uh, virtual products, and things like, I don't know if you've seen a YouTube video on MIT Sixth Sense, uh, where they use a small projector. So rather than having a physical cell phone or a physical computer, uh, you use your hand or a piece of paper as your interface. It just projects the keypad on your hand. You call the number, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's a neat video, a neat concept. And again, it's this type of virtualization of products and things. And we give those away to consumers if they reduce their carbon footprint. Another great example, as was announced today, is the case Western Pilot with Kindle uh, DX. Uh, I think uh, this is a great example, again, of this type of concept. Uh, one pound of printer paper generates about four pounds of CO2. One pound of newspaper produces three pounds of CO2, but one textbook produces five pounds of CO2. Babcock School of Management, uh, which has about 160 students, estimates that textbooks alone produces 45 tons of CO2 at that school. Now, if, if carbon, is going to be $20 a ton and with cap and trade go up to $100 a ton, that's thousands and thousands of dollars we're talking about. And so uh, uh, using a Kindle DX, for example, not only does that benefit having all your textbooks there, not only does it benefit the students back, uh, it also reduces the cost of textbooks, but it also can help the environment. 
And so we are arguing that no, we shouldn't be selling these things to students, we should be giving them away in exchange that they reduce their carbon footprint. How we can do that is they pay extra for student parking or they agree, agree to take buses or faculty, we charge them a, a tax on their travel. Uh, there's numer numerous ways we can do this. Uh, that we don't have to wait for big government to impose things. We can do things here locally on our campus and really show to the world how by rewarding, providing a new environment, uh, collaborative technologies, is not only helps education, but also helps the environment. And why we want to do this is consumers control our influence. 60% of emissions, 35% uh, directly through our transportation, heating homes, 25% indirectly through uh, uh, our book goods and products. So if we can just demonstrate this in universities that virtualizing things and rewarding students, this is something that we can transfer into the greater society in helping address this challenge. Another good example is uh, in the UK, in San Francisco, they're providing free Wi-Fi on buses for students. So uh, these buses are free, so get the students out of their cars, they get on this bus, but on, now they've got free Wi-Fi, they can do their homework or play video games, whatever they want to do. But again, it makes now using ICT, uh, taking a bus, a more enjoyable experience rather than being set, uh, uh, stuck in traffic. A company in California, in San Francisco, is doing this for commuters going from Marion County in the city. Uh, they provide, have a hybrid diesel bus. They're providing a little seat with a uh, desk, a Wi-Fi, femto cell service. So they got an office on the bus. They can do all the work, do all the communications on the way into the office, and again, uh, really save an impact. And this is another great example of how we can use ICT as a reward to make life more enjoyable, more efficient, more productive. Uh, by reducing carbon. And as I mentioned, we have a project in Ottawa. We're a bit stalled at the moment because there's no retail ISPs, uh, but Google has been uh, blocking about this quite a bit, uh, 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 Derek Slater, uh, and there's pilots. Uh, I'm pleased to see something like this happening now here in Cleveland, uh, but there's also ones in Switzerland and, uh, and, and uh, Amsterdam, where again, what we want to do is provide high, to the home high-speed internet using fiber as a reward to the consumer uh, for reducing their carbon footprint. How we're doing that is we're working with energy retail companies and gas resale companies to, and getting the customer on a voluntary basis to pay an extra small premium of about two cents per kilowatt hour on the electrical bill uh, and then they're encouraged to reduce their electrical consumption. And, and if they do so, then their total cost of heat, energy, triple play and the internet is, will be less than they pay for now. And it is a guaranteed revenue stream to the uh, electrical company and the gas supplier. Also gives a guaranteed revenue stream to the network provider because now the revenue is based on the consumer's energy and carbon footprint rather than fickle play of, in use of uh, services and applications over the internet. So uh, we're, uh, we hope, uh, we're working closely with our colleagues here in Cleveland. We hope this will uh, take off here as well. Uh, but the, the one in Switzerland is doing this nationwide uh, and uh, building up fiber of the homes. And there's a number of other projects in Australia as well are looking at this as another possible approach. The lessons to take away from now, talk to university, IT people, get your carbon inventory done now. The sooner you can do your carbon inventory and baseline emissions measurement, the sooner you'll be able to capitalize on carbon offsets or buying permits uh, from your utility when cap and trade comes. At a, with the cap and trade, the price of carbon goes $100 a ton. University of Indiana, their electrical costs just for the data centers can go up to increase by $30 million a year. So I don't know what here it is, Case Western's probably about $10 million a year, an increase in electrical cost. On the other hand, if you move to a zero carbon strategy, get those computers using renewable energy and whatever, you can make $30 million a year revenue. So it's, it's, you know, it's a really, a, it's quite a fantastic opportunity if you start thinking about that now. Uh, there is, uh, here in the United States, of course, if you're not uh, uh, signed on to the American College University's President's Climate Commitment, uh, you know, they're all very much aware of this, and they have, as uh, the signatories agreed, to complete comprehensive greenhouse gas inventories, get moving. Don't wait. Most of the people, it's in the facilities departments, the steam and uh, electrical guys. It's the ICT guys. The ICT guys are the worst culprits on campus. It's not the heating and air conditioning guys. And that's really what surprises a lot of people. When your president finds that out, he's going to come down real heavy on and you're finding solutions, believe me. Uh, another great example is we've signed an MOU between the uh, University of British Columbia, University of California, uh, other institutions, University of Florida, and so others are going to join us in doing this virtual trading, setting up uh, uh, this green commerce and so forth, looking at uh, how we can help universities uh, move in this world as a showcase to the uh, uh, rest of the planet. So final remarks. Again, I want to stress the problem we face on this planet is not energy consumption. We have abundance of energy. 
It's a carbon problem. Think carbon, not energy consumption. So in all your solutions, and when your vendors come to you and say, I got a 10% more efficient product, say, crap, bullshit, show me what the actual carbon footprint is, show me how this is gonna reduce my carbon, not my energy consumption. Collaborative technologies we've seen here today can really play an important role uh, in reducing carbon footprint, but also can be paid for entirely through carbon offsets. You th the, the Kindle, all these other great things, video conferencing and so forth, can, if you do this carbon calculation and reduce your carbon footprint, it can pay for this. And, and, this, and this, you got to make your vendors understand this. This is a whole new financial mechanism. We're all cash strapped at our institutions. Here's a whole new way of paying for new computers, new facilities, with a dime going out of your pocket or your university's pocket. And also, as I said, they can be used as a, an incentive, these te technologies, in what's called G-commerce, uh, as opposed to the old word e-commerce, green commerce, to encourage students and faculty to reduce their own f footprint in their own aspects of their lives. Thank you. There's more information on my blogs, a lot more detailed papers, and so on and so forth. It's the median of a, a confidence interval. Have you looked at uh, individual um, options within the carbon tax bracket? I mean, I know you're not proposing that as the primary you know, winning solution, but it's, you know, you're saying it's, it's feasible, it could be feasible. Because you know, I went to Europe and went to Germany and met with people at the Rubicon Institute there, Professor Ott and others, and they found you know, a progressive use tax to be pretty successful there. I mean, I know they have different you know, political system there, but you know, it could, we're trending towards <laughs> pseudo-socialism in some respects, so... Oh, that's another, it's another tool in the, in the toolbox, absolutely. Uh, again, I say, I personally don't like taxes. I don't know anybody who does like paying taxes. If we can find ways where you actually get benefit from this, you get a reward, uh, you get some new products or service instead of a tax, I, I think you'll respond much better. We've seen that with air, point, air mile points, hotel uh, programs, and so forth. To me, that's a, a much way, better way of selling something than penalizing, rather it's progressive or carbon or whatever. And it also seems like a hybridization you know, of the various feasible models might work as well, at least until you know, it's ferreted out which is best. Yeah, and we have to explore. always just possibilities. Exactly. Have, you know, multiple feasible models there. Yeah, so we have to explore all angles. We, we, and we've got to do it fast. Different states might adopt different ones, but at least if they're all adopting something, you're you know, aggregating a... And, and doing something is important.